types of shoulder instability. This talk is going to focus on the glenohumeral humeral joint, which has a large spherical humeral head with a relatively shallow glenoid. This configuration allows the glenohumeral humeral joint to be the most mobile joint in the body, but at the same time it is inherently unstable and is the most easily dislocated joint in the body. However, dislocation of the glenohumeral humeral joint is still relatively rare and this is due to the complex arrangement of static and dynamic stabilizers that help to keep the glenohumeral humeral joint stable. Although the glenoid is shallow, its concavity does supply some stability and this effective glenoid arc is doubled by the surrounding glenoid labrum. The glenohumeral ligaments, which are actually condensations of the joint capsule, work as check reins. They tighten at the extremes of certain movements, such as abduction and external rotation for the anterior inferior glenohumeral ligament, which triggers mechanoreceptors which help to stabilise the joint. The intact capsule and glenohumeral ligaments create negative intraarticular pressure, which increases stability by concavity compression. Surrounding the joint capsule are the four rotator cuff muscles passing from the scapula to the humeral head. The rotator cuff tendons are constantly in tension, and by a combination of eccentric and eccentric changes in tension, they're able to move the joint, constantly keeping the humeral head centered. The static stabilizers, the concavity of the joint, and the labrum, the glenohumeral humeral ligaments, the negative pressure creating concavity compression, the dynamic stabilizers in the form of the rotator cuff muscles work in an equilibrium so that the glenohumeral humeral joint can move into all positions while constantly centered. Until relatively recently, these were thought to be the only components of joint stability. Using this model, instability of the glenohumeral humeral joint was described as either being traumatic or atraumatic, Traumatic was either tearing of the glenohumeral humeral ligaments, such as a bankart tear or the labrum, or atraumatic, where none of the ligaments are actually damaged, but instability was due to capture laxity. A previous anachronym for this type of instability model was TUBS, traumatic unidirectional bankart always requires surgery, and AMBRI, atraumatic multidirectional bilateral rehabilitation or an inferior capsule shift. However, this model did not cover all types of instability, more recently we've realised there's a third component to shoulder stability, which is known as muscle patterning. Muscle patterning takes into account not only the dynamic stabiliser of the shoulder, but also the superficial muscles that move the shoulder. In muscle patterning there's an altered muscle recruitment pattern. There's overactivity of the superficial muscles, often the pectoralis major or latissimus dorsi, with a corresponding inhibition of the deep stabilising muscles of the rotator cuff. This imbalance can create a shearing force which dislocates the shoulder. As we saw earlier, the structural dynamic stabilizers of the shoulder are the rotator cuff muscles. The key superficial muscles are the scapular stabilizers, such as the trapezius and the rhomboids, and the humeral attachments, particularly latissimus dorsi and the pec major, which are the two muscles that are most frequently involved in muscle patterning. Muscle patterning is complex and the overactivity of the various muscle groups actually alters through the range of glenohumeral movement. However, in general, when the direction of instability is anterior, pec major tends to be particularly overactive and latissimus dorsi less so, with some inhibition of infraspinatus. And for posterior instability, pec major is less involved with latissimus dorsi being more involved and subscapularis being inhibited. This is a live screening of fluoroscopy of a patient with predominantly anterior muscle patterning, so dominance of pec major, and you can see how the glenohumeral joint is jumping in and out as the movements go up and down, and also note the abnormal scapular humeral rhythm. Treatment involves highly specialised physiotherapy, but in fact a massive improvement can be obtained within a relatively short period in the space of half an hour. However, Intensive physiotherapy is then required for this to be sustained. This can often take six months to a year. This is the same patient an hour later after specific physiotherapy. You can see now how smooth the glenohumeral humeral movement is and also the scapular humeral movement is now nice and smooth. So our current understanding of shoulder instability is that it has three components. A traumatic structural component, an atraumatic structural component and a muscle patterning non-structural component. The same patient can have more than one component at any one time, so the components can overlap and they can also change over time, particularly as treatment progresses. These three overlapping components can be represented in a Venn diagram, but are far better described in the Stanmore Triangle. A 
triangle has got three poles, so type 1 is traumatic structural, type 2 atraumatic structural, and type 3 muscle patterning. An individual's instability can be represented anywhere within the area of the triangle. So for example, a patient with polar type 1, so traumatic structural instability, particularly if this has been going along for quite a while, will develop a, an element of compensatory muscle patterning, which is non-structural. Similarly, most patients with atraumatic structural instability will have an element of muscle patterning. As patients recover, they will move around the triangle and therapy is aimed at correcting the various components of their instability. So in diagnosing the instability of a particular patient, it's important to take into account their history, whether there's been trauma, recurrence and the frequency. When examining them, it's important to look for ligamentous laxity, looking for instability signs, scapulohumeral rhythm and evidence of muscle sequencing. Then investigations such as an MRI arthrogram or CT to look at any structural component. It's only once you've assessed these components and applied them to the Stanmore Triangle that you can actually diagnose a particular patient's type, type of instability. If you'd like to see more videos on instability and the various surgical treatments, visit my YouTube channel Cambridge Shoulder or my website cambridgeshoulder.co.uk.